Hello and welcome to Compass Online. Whether you are watching from the comfort and coziness of your home or joining us from our Grand Valley watch party, we are thankful that you have taken time to engage with us here today. We're excited to lead you into a time of worship this morning and our lead pastor Andrew will be continuing on in our series Cancel Chaos. But before we get to that, we want to highlight a few things for you. We know that it's hard to imagine green grass and trips to the beach and backyard barbecues right now, but summer is right around the corner. And what does that, what does that mean here at Compass? It means Compass Camps. In addition to three weeks here at our Orangeville site and one week in Shelburne, we are adding a fifth week for our Grand Valley site. Space is filling fast, so sign up today on our website to reserve your spot. We've been hearing some great reports from around our community about our book clubs. From one member who joins us all the way from PEI, to people cutting their screen time in half, we are encouraged by the reports making their way back to us. If you're a part of a book club, thank you for joining. And secondly, let us know how it's been encouraging for you. We have some incredible news from our newcomer ministry. This past week, we welcomed with open arms 18-year-old Samuel. Samuel has been separated from his family for the last 13 years. On February the 1st, finally, he was reunited with his mom and his dad and his little brother. We are thankful for our newcomer team who has helped assist and support this family to get to this very sacred moment. As we prepare to move into a time of worship, we want to encourage you to be reminded that worship is more than just giving of our voices and singing, but it's also giving of our talents and our time and our treasures. We want to give a big thank you to those that have been uh, faithful and generous in their financial giving. We also want to invite you, if you haven't already, to consider partnering with us in your giving. Your generosity helps continue our mission of seeing the spiritual transformation of people, families, and communities in our region and globally. Your gifts help us be known by love. To find out how you can partner with us, simply visit listuscompass.com slash give. Will you join me today as I pray? Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to gather from across our region, our country, and our world. As we prepare to give you our worship, to open our hearts to your word, we also want to stop and give thanks. We thank you for the team that is planning and getting ready for Compass Camps. Even now, we pray for the staff, the campers, and the community that they will come to know you more through these five weeks of camps. We thank you for the amazing conversations and connections that are happening through our home groups and our book clubs. We pray, God, for those to grow and for people to learn more about who you are through slowing down and focusing their lives. God, we thank you for Samuel, for his safe arrival and reconnection with his family here in Canada. We pray for a smooth transition as he settles into life here. God, we join with them in celebration as they have their son and brother return to them. And God, we thank you for the faithful and generous givers here at Compass. We thank you for the gifts that you have provided so that we can continue to serve our communities here in Orangeville, in Shelburne, in Grand Valley, in Dufferin County, and even online. God, may we continue to be wise with the gifts you have given so that we will be known by our love and so that your name will be known through us. And God, as we continue and prepare to uh, join our hearts in worship, we welcome you into our space. We welcome your Holy Spirit into our homes, into our watch party in Grand Valley, and into our hearts. We pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen.
your kingdom come here let your will be Silence and solitude. We struggle to find it, and yet we so desperately need it. The opportunity to sit quiet and reflect on God's presence and love, or simply to take some deep breaths and review your day with God. Most of us long for moments of peace and quiet, and yet when they come, they don't last long. We far too quickly run away. We reach for our phone, we busy ourselves, we turn on the radio, we wash the dishes, we check email, we yield to distraction, anything to break the quiet. The truth be told, most of us can't stand long periods of silence and solitude. In the very busy 1600s, philosopher Blaise Pascal famously wrote, all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit in a quiet room alone because it's not the busyness and noise of the world that takes us down, it's the busyness and noise that we have inside. Christian author Henry Nouwen warns us that without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. For all that wars against our souls, I think that one of the greatest obstacles to spiritual growth and, relation, and our relationship with God is simply our inability to sit alone with Jesus in the quiet for any amount of time. Often we don't experience the reality of his presence and the depth of his love because we simply can't sit still long enough. We're in the midst of a teaching series called Cancel Chaos where we are using the book The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And we're learning how to follow the teaching and the lifestyle of Jesus when it comes to living an unhurried life. In week one, we saw the problem. Our inner life, our outer life, our public life, our private life. It's all hurried and busied and rushed and distracted, regardless of our age, stage of life, married, not married, kids, no kids, working in school or retired, pandemic or no pandemic. We rush through our days and we miss God. In week two, we saw the solution, which John Mark Comer argues isn't just the need for more time. Rather, the solution is Jesus and, and the need to learn from Jesus how to reorder our days so that we can connect with God and live life to the full. To apprentice ourselves to Jesus and to learn from him. And now we come to week three where we look at the practices of unhurrying our lives. They all flow from the life of Jesus. Jesus teaches us and models them for us. They are silence and solitude, Sabbath and simplicity, and slowing. And rather than just talking about them, we wanna practice them as part of our worship service today. Corporate worship gives us the opportunity to remember and then to practice what we want to live out in our lives the rest of the week. So intentionally, in the midst of our worship today, we're creating an opportunity for you to practice this, for you to simply be quiet and become aware of God's presence with you right where you are. So here's what I want you to do. I just want you to get comfortable. Sit back and close your eyes if you're comfortable. 
and just breathe deeply. As you do, consider doing something physically that acknowledges you're giving this time to God. Maybe it's simply opening your hands or touching your heart, putting your fingers to your lips, or making the sign of the cross. Become aware and acknowledge what's going on in your mind right now. What are you thinking about? What's vying for your attention? What thoughts and emotions are going through your heart and are distracting you right now? Consciously offer them to God. Ask him to hold them for you right now. And then shift your attention away from them and on to Jesus. And for a moment of silence and solitude, remind yourself that Jesus is with you. His loving gaze is on you. And as we sit in silence, focus in on his splendor, glory, holiness, and grace. Give him permission to speak to you quietly, to give you a word, to encourage you, guide you, correct and convict you, just to be with you. And then after a time of silence, we will sing together. Surely you're good. 
It was very early in the morning and still dark. Jesus got up and left the house. He went to a place where he could be alone. There he prayed. My beloved calls to me, arise my darling, come away with me, my beautiful one. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, you can go to and experience what is one of the quietest places on earth. It's called the Orfield Anaconic Room, and it registers at minus nine decibels. Just to put that into perspective, our singing and worship in our worship services usually runs between 92 and 95 decibels. And a room that you would normally consider quiet is about 30 decibels. But in the anechoic chamber, there is no echo at all. The room absorbs 99.9% .9 of the sound. The room is so quiet that you can actually hear your own organs functioning. For $250, you can book time in the room, but you're only allowed to go for a short supervised stay. For some of you, as we begin to come out of two years of shutdown, online schooling, working from home in a cramped house, that kind of peace and quiet might sound like a dream, but it's not. In fact, it quickly turns into a nightmare. Apparently, being in a room so quiet that you can hear your own heartbeat, stomach, and lungs as your only reference point quickly becomes disorienting. The longest anyone has spent in the room alone is 45 minutes. The average person lasts about 20 minutes and then they become panicked and asked to be, to be released. For most of us, we long for moments of peace and quiet, but when they come, they don't last long and neither do we. Think back, when was the last time you were in a completely quiet place? And how long did it last? What did you do? Did you sit quietly and use it as an opportunity to reflect on God's presence and love for you? Did you take some deep breaths and review your day with gratitude? Did you pray? You probably did what most of us do. Reach for your phone, pick up a book, turn on some music, start a conversation because most of us can't stand extended periods of silence. Richard Foster in 1978, no less, wrote that the exact this is the exact place where the enemy attacks. In contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in the muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. And things have only gotten noisier and more hurried and crowded since 1978. Which is why we so desperately need the practice of silence and solitude. Silence and solitude is as simple as it sounds. Intentionally spending time in quiet 
with God, being alone with God. It is a time to, in the words of Ronald Orlheiser, to rest in God's presence. What he likens to what happens between married couples and parents and kids and really good friends, what they experience together by merely being in one another's presence. He writes, it's enough to be relaxed and quiet in the presence of God, ready to receive and return God's loving glance. We find examples of silence and solitude all the way through the scriptures. In the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, David writes in Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. Psalm 62 begins, for God alone my soul waits in silence. Maybe the most famous Old Testament example is Elijah on Mount Horeb in 1 Kings chapter 19, where the Lord comes to Elijah, not in the wind, nor in the earthquake, nor in the fire, but in a low whisper, a thin silence, a still small voice. Where we find this practice of silence and solitude most evident is in the life of Jesus. And as Christians, we not want to not only know the truth of Jesus, we want to understand and live out the way of Jesus. We want to pursue the disciplines of silence and solitude because Jesus did. John Mark Comer writes it, writes it this way, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, if you want to live the life of Jesus, you must practice the lifestyle of Jesus. Regular times alone with God the Father in quiet communion with the Holy Spirit as a foundational practice for our life. Jesus regularly withdrew from the crowds and disciples in the early morning or late in the evening just to be alone with God. His longest recorded period of solitude is, is given to us in Mark chapter 1. And I'd like you to turn there in the, your Bible. Mark chapter 1 verses 12 to 13. The same event is recorded in Matthew chapter 5 and in Luke chapter 4. But here in Mark 1, we are simply told, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. We often hear and tell stories about Jesus' miracles and his teachings and his interaction with people we may be not as quick to recall the regularity with which Jesus was going off on his own. The Greek word we want to hone in on for just a few minutes here is the word eremos. It's often translated desert or wilderness in your Bible. It simply means a solitary place, a lonely and a quiet place. The word shows up over 30 times in the Gospels. Most of all, with, in reference to Jesus, including right here in Mark chapter 1. Let me just set the context for you. Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry. He goes out and he is baptized by John. And after his baptism, what does he do? The Holy Spirit sends him off into the wilderness. He heads straight for the Eremos. And this is not just an overnight camping trip. Verse 13 tells us he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Jesus, the Messiah, God in human flesh, begins the most grueling stretch of his, of his life, three years of ministry, and then his crucifixion, death, resurrection, by, by pre preparing himself with 40 days of solitude and silence. Comer points out that we often think about the wilderness as a place of weakness, but it's actually a place of strength. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness because it was there and only there that Jesus was at the height of his spiritual power. It was only after a month of a month and a half of prayer and fasting in this quiet place that he had the capacity to, to, to take on the devil himself and to emerge and walk away unscathed in total victory. That's why over and over again, we see Jesus come back to the Eremos. Remember Foster's quote from earlier? Our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. And one of Satan's 
primary tactics is to fill your world and your life with noise and hurry so that you lose your sense of awareness about life, about yourself, and about God's presence, power, and truth. But in silence and solitude, in the Eremos, we refocus our attention, we remember our identity, and we become aware of God's presence. It's where we become spiritually strong. Now just keep reading. This chapter is amazing. And we start to realize that in the gospel, this is far from an isolated incident. After the 40 days of solitude, Jesus returns to begin his ministry and he immediately calls his disciples to come and to follow him. And then he heads for Capernaum. He arrives on the Sabbath and he goes to the synagogue where Jesus begins teaching. We don't know how long he preaches for, but he has a busy morning. When he finishes teaching, we are told in verse 23 that just then, a man with an evil spirit confronts him. Jesus takes, takes care of the evil spirit and heals the man. Then, verse 29 says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they head for Simon and Andrew's house. Turns out Simon's mother-in-law is ill. Jesus has, has come here to spend some time with the family and he spends time praying for and healing her. And then verse 32 says, in the evening after the sunset, many came and they brought their, the sick and the demon possessed for Jesus to heal. Suffice to say that this was a pretty full day for the Messiah. So what does Jesus do the next day? Verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Comer writes, you'd think that Jesus would have slept in, gone for a light run, and then had brunch with the disciples, but no, in response to the busyness and the noise, he seeks out silence and solitude with God. Let me give you a couple of more examples in the chapters that follow. In Mark chapter 6, verse 32, it says, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. In Matthew 14, it says, when Jesus heard about what had happened, meaning the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Luke chapter 5. The news about him spread all the more so that the crowds, the crowds of the people came to hear him and to be healed by their, from their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to the lonely places and prayed. It's so easy to miss. But Jesus made a point, a common habit, a regular practice. He was ruthless about pursuing times of solitude and silence with God. Sometimes we think, well, Jesus was the son of God, so he must have had superhuman powers to live the life that he did. But when we conclude that, we disregard his humanity because in his flesh, in his humanness, Jesus needed times to rest, to refuel, to refocus, to prepare. Notice it wasn't as if Jesus had nothing else to do. There were people to heal and sermons to preach and people to feed and crowds following. He was the Messiah. Have you ever felt like you were getting pulled in like eight different directions by life? When we get overly busy and life gets hectic and people are vying for our time, the quiet place is the first thing that goes rather than being the first place we go. In order to be able to give the best that he had, Jesus knew that he needed to fully rest, to be focused and filled up. He needed to be connected to God. Jesus came out of silence and solitude with clarity about his identity and his calling. He was grounded and he was centered. One of the most interesting features of Jesus' time alone with God is that those times became more frequent as his ministry grew. Again, John Mark writes, you can chart Jesus' life along two axis points. 
The busier and more in demand and famous Jesus became, and the more he withdrew to his quiet place to pray. Jesus needed to be alone in quiet with the Father, and so do we. But why is silence and solitude so important? Silence and solitude is essential to abiding with Jesus. Simply put, we must make time to be with those we love. We know this to be true in our relationships, in our families and marriages. It's no different with Jesus. Henry Nouwen writes, if we really believe not only that God exists, but that also he is actively present in our lives, healing, teaching, and guiding, we need to set time aside and space to give him our undivided attention. Silence and solitude creates the space to give Jesus our attention. Silence and solitude helps us integrate other spiritual practices. As you slow down and spend time with God, all of a sudden there's an opportunity for scripture reading and prayer and Sabbath. It all becomes possible in a way that you can't do when you're rushing about from one thing to the next. Second, silence and solitude is an act of embodied trust in God. For most of us, the moment we try to sit quietly with Jesus is also the moment our minds begin to race. We begin to think about all the things that we should be doing instead. We think about our to-do list. We worry about everything that we'll forget if we don't write it down or immediately do something about it. And that's one of the most challenging aspects of silence and solitude, but it's one of the reasons it's so important for us. Silence and solitude forces us to entrust those cares and concerns to the Lord, to actually be still and know that he is the Lord and to remember that you are not. Everything in us fights against this because we don't want to give up control. That's why it is so much easier to talk about and read about silence and solitude than to actually do it. But part of the grace of this practice is that, that we discover that when we actually stop, God meets us in that time and God can be trusted. He will take care of and hold those concerns that so easily consume us. Third, silence and solitude exposes our hearts. Our addiction to hurry and noise comes in part from a desire to keep those painful, overwhelming emotions at bay. We think if I remain busy enough, distracted enough, scheduled enough, then I don't have to feel the hurt, the pain, the anger, the anxiety, or the grief that's inside. I don't have to acknowledge how sad, lonely, or scared I really am. In silence and solitude, all of our favorite ways to escape or numb those feelings are taken away, and we begin to feel those emotions, the ones that we've been working really hard not to feel. Similarly, silence and solitude strips away the mask we wear around others. All the ways I strive for affirmation and recognition from other people are gone when I step into quiet. My attempts to justify myself through hard work and achievement get tossed aside and I'm left with who I really am before God. For this reason, Lewis Bauer says, solitude is a terrible trial for it serves to crack open and burst apart the shell of our superficial securities. But before you stop listening or say, I will never attempt this practice, consider this. Silence and solitude allows all those emotions, all those fears, all those attempts to make yourself lovable come to the surface in the presence of Jesus. What a grace. Fourth, silence and solitude is where Jesus meets us with his love and grace. We meet the one who has endless compassion and mercy for us. The one who died to bring healing and wholeness and salvation to us. The one who loves and cherishes us the most. The one who knows and loves the real you. Dane Ortland writes, he doesn't simply meet us at our place of need, he lives in our place of need. He never tires of sweeping us into his tender embrace. It is his very heart. Silence and solitude enables us to experience the overwhelming grace and love of Jesus in all the places we need it most. But don't miss this basic truth. Jesus wants to be with you. 
He wants to spend time with you. That's why he endured the cross, so that you as a broken, beloved sinner could enter into his presence and into relationship and friendship with him. Listen to what Jesus asked the Father for the night before his crucifixion. In prayer, he says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me. That's his desire. And that is why Jesus invites you into the quiet place with him. So let's get really practical. How do we actually begin to live out this practice of silence and solitude? Here's some suggestions. First of all, choose a consistent time of day and a place that is quiet, comfortable, and as much as possible without distraction. For most people, first thing in the morning works best. For those with young kids, nap time might be a more realistic time. For others, it would be a lunch break, after work, or right before bed might work well. Feel free to experiment with this. Find the time that works for you. I suggest that you start with just 10 minutes, maybe three days a week. Start small and as you're able to, continue to expand and increase the time and frequency. Set a timer so you're not consistently looking at the clock. Two, put your phone away and remove other potential distractions. No music, podcasts, devotions, just you and Jesus and the Bible. Three, begin with a short prayer asking God to be with you. Perhaps you could focus your heart with a familiar prayer or, or with a verse of scripture like Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Remember the main goal here is to just be with God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Don't feel like you have to do anything. Just relax and enjoy his presence. Four, gently return your attention to God as distractions arise, because they will come. Your mind will, be, will seize this opportunity to run wild with thoughts, emotions, feelings, memories, to-dos, distractions, and that's okay. Don't judge yourself, feel bad, give up, or worry. When you notice your mind wandering, just recenter and say a quick prayer, maybe based on the scriptures that you use to start your time, but just come back to God. Every time you wander, it's an opportunity to choose to focus on him again, and each time, God is pleased. Fifth, Notice and reflect on anything that emerges or shimmers. Now, don't force this, but reflect and think, is there, is there a particular joy that you're celebrating? A loss that you're grieving? Are there tears that have been waiting to be shed? Is there a question that's stirring? Is there anger, frustration, or some thought or emotion that you need to express to God that you haven't had opportunity to do? Were there any words from God, gifts of grace or encouragements? This is where keeping a journal is so helpful just to write them down and to keep them and to reflect over them and to start to see the pattern of what God is communicating to you. Sixth, remember that succeeding at this practice is doing it, period. All you can do is show up. Know that Jesus is with you, whether you are aware of his presence or not, and be patient. It sometimes takes years to get comfortable with this practice. So resist saying, I'm bad at this. This isn't for me. Don't be hard on yourself, especially if you're the overachieving type. The point of your time of silence and solitude is to do nothing. Don't try to make anything happen. Silence and solitude is about you learning to stop doing, stop producing, stop pleasing people, stop entertaining yourself, stop obsessing, stop doing anything except for simply being yourself before God and being found by him in this time. These are noisy days we live in, busy days. 
And Comer writes, the noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we need most. You might want to book some time in the quiet chamber. Or maybe you should just change a few of your habits in life. Instead of playing Candy Crush for 20 minutes over lunch, you could just sit in silence and connect with God. Or maybe make it a regular part of your day just to go outside for a walk and don't take your phone with you. Make the choice not to immediately turn on the TV when you walk in the door or turn on the radio when you jump in the car. Pick a day each week when you will not consume any social media at all. Think about it. If you want a life that is marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, perseverance, contentment, and rest like you see in the life of Jesus? If you want to live the life of Jesus, you need to start to practice the lifestyle of Jesus. So let's learn from Jesus and make silence and solitude a core practice of our faith. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, thank you for revealing yourself to us today and for offering us by grace through the cross an invitation into friendship with you. We recognize your amazing power that is at work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessing over us. Thank you that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you for your great love and mercy. Thank you that you are always with us and you will never leave us. Oh Lord, draw us into the quiet place with you. Transform our aloneness and our loneliness into solitude in your presence. Help us set our eyes and our hearts afresh on you. Renew our spirits. Fill us with peace and joy. We love you. We need you. This day and every day. And we praise and give you thanks, for you alone are worthy. Amen.
As we come to the end of our service, I want us to pause for a moment and look back. This might be the type of review that you would do with God at the end of a regular day. Remember, we're practicing what we want to live out. This is a pause of gratitude and examine. Think back over the service, over, over the last hour. What one word comes to mind? What one word describes what you've witnessed? Maybe a gift or an insight you've received. What you take with you from this time. Think back on your whole day. How did you feel when you woke up this morning? What were you thinking about as the service began? Was there something that you surrendered to God and asked him to hold? Do you remember how we started out singing joyfully, the lion and the lamb and king of heaven? How we then came into a time of quiet reflection followed by a familiar hymn. We heard from scripture, hearing the words of the Gospel of Mark, the Song of Solomon, the book of Habakkuk, and the Psalms. We looked at how Jesus pursued moments of silence and solitude with with the Father and invites us to do the same. And now, in a moment of quiet, Before we transition into all the other things that our day holds for us, we pause and we reflect back with gratitude. We were silent at the beginning to give God the first word. And now we are silent as we close because God has the last word too. As we wait on God, I want you to think of what one word comes to mind. Don't speak it, just hold it for now. So what was your word? If you're watching online, I'd love you just to to text that uh, in the chat. Or maybe if you're watching with someone, you can share your word with them. If you're watching in Grand Valley, I'd love for you to speak it out into the room. What is your word for today? Of his 
His glory and grace. It's been good to be with you, friends. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. This world is a noisy place. Whether it be literal noise or our thoughts that are plaguing us, we can often get too distracted from hearing God's voice. Today, take a few moments of silence and solitude and spend it with Jesus. Maybe it's a walk outside. Maybe it's sitting on your comfy chair wrapped in a blanket with a hot cup of coffee or tea, or maybe it's even an afternoon nap. However it looks for you, be purposeful with your time. And as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, I pray the same prayer for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you may grow in your knowledge of Him. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so you can understand the confident hope He has given us. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. Be blessed as you go and go in the peace, the love, and the light of Jesus. We'll see you next week. Thank you.